Southeast family, how are you? <laughs> good to see there. you today. Uh, Matt Reagan with my good friend Kanisha, and we're just glad that you're here. I want you to know um, that we do. We do want you to get into a group. Um, as a matter of fact, we were chatting about it. You could literally go ahead, like right now, you could go ahead and notch off one of those January 1 things, right? Go ahead and register. Go to 733-733, type in groups. But here's the kicker. You could go ahead, write out your New Year's resolution list, Jump back to the top, put groups with your little box, check it off, get a head start on your New Year's resolution. I think that's a great idea. Kanisha, some of us don't want to talk New Year's resolutions quite yet because <laughs> I got some food to eat. I got some presents to open. But you have priorities. I got priorities. Um, but speaking of priority and speaking of just goodness, I, I hope that you were able to be a part of the Awaken a Happy Hour. They had a Christmas special yes. they just showed. It was so good. And once you know, there's, uh, they're going to take a little break, but they're going to be back, Kanisha. I, know, I think I know it's we, we love some worship here. I, we are definitely worshipers. We're worship I love the idea of being able to just hear those Christmas songs, hear Awaken Worship, really pour their heart into it, get us into the season. It is Christmas week. You Come can on. hit connect, 733-733. Find out how we can serve you and find out all more about Christmas, which there's a lot more to come. Love it. January 12th at 1130 p.m. We're going to be hopping back into the Awaken happy hour. And so it's just so good. But 1130 a.m. If it's 11. 1130 p.m., they might sing some nursery rhymes and lullabies. But 1130 a.m., Awaken Worship is going to be here for you with their happy hour. I love that. And so <laughs> here's the thing. We do like worship. I know that a lot of you love worship. My favorite worship service is coming up, Kenesha. Same. And I it just, think it's going to be amazing. It's, it's Christmas be, Eve service. Come on. Come on. So Christmas Eve services, uh, they'll be online. Tell us when they are. 3.30, 7 p.m., 11 p.m. My favorite is 11, uh, simply because, too. like, too. everything's quiet. It's the last thing you do on Christmas Eve before so Christmas true. morning. I will be here at 11 p.m. with my bells on. I will be here at all of the services because that's what I do. <laughs> You're built a little but different, But it's Matt. so fun. It's one of the best. And don't want to have you miss it. It really is one of our favorite services. And so speaking of favorites, Kanisha... We have a favorite. His name is Dave Stone, and he's going to be with us today and to tell us a little bit more about what he's going to be preaching about. Let's kick it to Dave. Hey, Southeast family. Thanks so much for joining us. I'm going to be preaching today, and I'm really excited about it. I really have looked forward to this because my topic is on sacrifice and on generosity. And I know we're wrapping up the series, Empty the Jar. And we've talked a lot about how it is that we can empty the jar and some of the great things that are going to come out of that. And so we're going to go a little bit deeper, taking a look at the, the life of Joseph in the Christmas story and see how it is that we can be people of sacrifice and people of generosity. So I hope it will spur you on to, to want to give more to others, not just with uh, what you have, but also with your time and with your testimony. So here's the deal. Um, Dave's here. We're here. You're here. It's Christmas week. Um, can't get much better than this. Absolutely not. I'm super excited for this powerful message that Dave is about to bring. Let's go ahead, get into worship. We'll be here when you get back.
us so much he sent his only son and without him we are nothing we have nothing have a seat if you would. We just sang some Latin words that mean glory to God in the highest. We sing those words a lot this time of year, but don't miss the significance of those words. Glory to God in the highest. God himself put on flesh, left the highest place, entered into this earth in a lowly manger to save all of mankind. That's pretty significant. And he lived a perfect life so that he could make the ultimate sacrifice by giving up his own life for the forgiveness of our sin. I want to read what Isaiah 53 says and prophesied about Jesus. It says, he had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him. Nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows, and familiar with suffering. Like one from whom men, whom men hide their faces, he was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he took up our infirmities and carried our sorrows, yet we considered him stricken by God, smitten by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds, we are healed. And we all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. And as we share in a time of communion, these next few moments, we remember the sacrifice that Jesus made for you and for me so that we might be free. Our debt is paid because of what Jesus sacrificially did for every one of us here. He left the highest to come to the lowest, to give us life and to bring us hope. And so as you hold that bread and that juice in your hand, they're reminders, symbols. There's nothing magic about them, but they just remind us of Christ's body broken for us, his blood shed on our behalf. And he did it all because of his great love for you. And so on your own time, you can eat and drink and or we're gonna continue to worship. But as you do that, we keep our minds and our hearts focused on Jesus, the real reason why we celebrate, not just this time of year, but moment by moment. Let's pray together and we'll take it, eat and drink. Lord, we thank you that you love us just the way we are. We also thank you that you love us enough not to leave us that way, but you want to transform us from the inside out. You want to give us peace. And so we call you Prince of Peace. You're a savior, a redeemer, and our place of refuge. And so we just lean into you now Jesus, remembering what you've done for us, that you made a way for us to be in right relationship with the heavenly Father that loves us. And so we thank you for that, and we do remember you, Jesus, in these moments, and we pray in your name, amen.
You can grab a seat. Hey, church family, this weekend we are wrapping up our Empty the Jar series where we are being challenged to respond to the generosity of God towards us through Jesus by being generous people. A few weeks ago, my 17-year-old son came home and told me that he was with some of his buddies at Chick-fil-A and he asked me, you wanna guess who bought our lunch? And I said, Dave Stone. And he said, how'd you know? because I know Dave Stone. And he is one of the most generous uh, people I know, but that generosity comes out of his love for God and his love for people. I'm grateful for the example that he has set, not just for me, but for our whole church. The generosity of our church comes from a legacy of people like Dave modeling the way and showing us what it looks like to live an empty the jar kind of life. Would you please welcome Dave Stone? Thank you. Thank you all. It's great to be back. Uh, that sure was nice of Kyle. Uh, my wife, Beth, and I, we were in Phoenix recently, and we probably weren't in the greatest part of town. Uh, a couple of people had already asked us for money in the parking lot, and we came out of this restaurant where we had, had got some food, gotten some food, and we came and we ate at some tables that were out there, and we kind of set up shop right there. Well, when we set up shop there, there was a guy that was kind of lurking around, kind of hanging around, and he was a little different, and he set up shop at the table right there next to us, and he started talking to us, and, you know, we enjoy making new friends, so he was talking away. Eventually, he kind of came over, and he was right there at our table talking to us, and he kept talking, and gradually, he kind of steered the conversation in the direction of spiritual matters. And while he's talking to me, I'm thinking, and I look over at Beth and I give her a look that communicates, oh, I think he's trying to lead me to the Lord. <laughs> and I look at Beth and she gives me a look like, you need the Lord. <laughs> and so sure enough, he went over and he got his Bible from his table and he brought it over. He had me reading scriptures out loud and he was explaining them to me. And it was really cool. I like being on that side of things just to kind of hear how people approach things. But after a while, he said, what part of Phoenix are you all from? I said, well, we're actually not from Phoenix. I said, we're from Kentucky. He said, Kentucky. He said, I've never been to Kentucky. I know one person in Kentucky. It's an author. His name's Kyle Eidelman. <laughs> and Beth and I looked at each other and we said, that's our pastor. That's the church that we go to. We know him. <laughs> <laughs> and the guy says, his book changed my life. And he told us the exact day that he read Kyle's book, Gods at War, and how it transformed his life. And we got to make a, a new friend that day named Tim. I share that with you because you need to know that Kyle and the staff and this church are having an impact that is far beyond the Kentuckiana region. And we've been in a series where we're looking at one of the mantras here at Southeast to empty the jar. And we wanna talk about how it is that we can really get outside of the walls of our church and, and make a difference in the community and in the region. And the Southeast leadership has prayerfully identified four different initiatives, uh, uh, an emergency house in LaGrange for trafficked women, a uh, building so that the Bullitt County campus has a, has a place to meet. Um, also, they've been looking at different campus-specific initiatives for each campus. And, and then with what took place a little over a week ago with the tornado, we wanna do our part and be Christ's hands and feet in Western Kentucky. And it's our prayer that our generosity will have a, a far-reaching impact beyond this area, whether that is in Phoenix, Arizona, or Mayfield, Kentucky, or the Dominican Republic, or Kenya, Africa. And we've been tying these messages in this series in with what we see in the biblical account of the Christmas story. And I've loved the correlation between generosity and the different people who played a role in that first Christmas. And last week, the, the different pastors at different campuses taught on the wise men and the gifts that they brought. And today we're gonna turn our attention to Joseph. Now, Joseph is one of the most forgotten members of that first Christmas. 
And after all, the little that we do know about him is not too impressive. It wouldn't look great on a resume. And Joseph didn't have much money. We, we know this because when he took Jesus to the temple, the, the sacrifice or the offering that he gave were, was two pigeons or, or two doves rather than a lamb, which meant that he couldn't afford the lamb. Joseph was a carpenter. And let's be honest, next to Mary, Joseph didn't get much attention. He kind of lived in her shadow. You probably heard the, in the news that Senator Bob Dole passed away two weeks ago. And for those of you over the age of 40, you may recall that back a number of years ago, he was running for the presidency. And many people thought that his wife, Elizabeth, made a better candidate for the presidency than, than Bob Dole did. She served as the Secretary of Labor at the time, and she was just very sharp and politically savvy. And during that campaign, there was an article for a national magazine that was being written about the Doles, and a photographer came over to their house to take some pictures, and he took a picture of uh, Mr. and Mrs. Dole making the bed in their bedroom. And after the photographer took the picture, he came over to Bob Dole. He said, hey, that was nice of you to, to do that. He said, did you just do that for the picture? And Bob Dole said, no, I do it every day. She did it for the picture. <laughs> and Joseph was kind of like that. He was a behind the scenes kind of guy who played his seemingly minor role with a lot of integrity and sacrifice. In fact, in all of the Bible, Joseph is never quoted, never says anything in all of the Bible. He seems as common as his name. But today we take a closer look at his life and I hope it will inspire us to make a similar sacrifice for Jesus. Let me make three observations about sacrifice from what little we do know about Joseph. Here's my first observation. Sacrifice requires obedience to what God demands. That's, that's the starting point right there. In the biblical account, uh, Matthew chapter two, verse 13, after the wise men were gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, flee to Egypt with the child and his mother. And the angel said, stay there until I tell you to return because Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. And Kyle reminded us a few weeks ago of just how ruthless Herod was having some of his own sons executed and even having his having his wife strangled. That's the type of person that Herod was that we're dealing with here. And so Mary and Joseph and Jesus, they flee quickly. And after bringing their gifts to Jesus, the wise men, an angel, warns them not to go back to the king and to head home a different way. You see, Herod wants to squelch this threat to his throne. And when Herod realizes that the wise men are too wise to come back and tell him the location of this baby, Herod sends out an order to kill every baby boy under the age of two anywhere close to Bethlehem. It's just kind of tough for us even to imagine living in such violent times. In Matthew chapter two, verses 14 and 15, that night, Joseph left for Egypt with the child and Mary, his mother, and they stayed there until Herod's death. This fulfilled what the Lord had spoken through the prophet. I called my son out of Egypt. That last phrase is a direct quote from Hosea. It's, it's a messianic prophecy. It's written hundreds of years before Jesus was born. And so it gives us a little glimpse of the different details of what this Messiah was going to be like when he came. It's one of the strongest proofs of the evidence of Jesus being who he says that he was. And it's a messianic prophecy that details the life of Jesus. And Joseph doesn't question God's warning. He doesn't bargain with God. No, the Bible says he got up and he took Mary and Joseph and they headed out for Egypt. And when Joseph heard God's message, he moved. That's what empty the jar people do because sacrifice requires obedience to what God demands. And you're going to see a pattern emerging with Joseph an angel of the Lord will appear to Joseph in a dream. And this will happen several times in, in Matthew 1 and 2. And evidently, Joseph had no doubt knowing in this dream that this was the Lord speaking to him. Now, I don't want you to make too much of a personal application when I, I talk about these dreams. 
I don't want you to think that, that each night you are getting some special message from the Lord in, in your dreams. I don't know about you all, I have crazy dreams, right? And sometimes the recurring dreams, rather than being something from God, they just reveal our stress or they reveal our fears. My wife has had a recurring dream for years that she is in a dream where people are knocking at the door, the house is a mess, they're coming over for dinner, and she hasn't even started cooking dinner. And she says, that's, that's the one that she always has. My recurring dream that I've had for the last 20 years involves this very room. You know what my dream is? My dream is it comes time for me to preach, and I am in a back hallway, and I am frantically trying to button my shirt and put my pants on. <laughs> and it just happens constantly. I'm trying to get situated. I know I'm supposed to be up here. So I don't know if that is a, a fear that I'll be late because in my mind, I don't want there to be awkward silence and for you, you all to feel uncomfortable waiting for me. But a bigger concern to me should be, why am I walking around the hallway at a worship service in my underwear? <laughs> That should concern me. <clears throat> that should concern you. Uh, <laughs> but every time an angel gave clear directions to Joseph, he did what God commanded him to do. And when you feel that nudge from the Holy Spirit or that prompting from God, I hope you'll follow through just like Joseph did. Back in the fall of 2014, uh, here at Southeast, we were about one month out from opening our Southwest campus uh, right off of, of Dixie Highway. And at that time, I got a letter from uh, a pastor. His name was Jason Isaacs, the pastor of Hope City Church. It said, Dear Dave, we are located less than five minutes from the new Southwest campus that you are currently building. It's common for churches to feel a sense of competition with each other for for natural reasons. And we have even wrestled with some of those same emotions since we heard that you all are building a campus near us. But we want you to know that we believe in Southeast and what you're doing to reach this city for Jesus Christ. And we're praying for you as you launch your new Southwest campus. And we have included with this letter a financial gift for your building fund. This is a sacrificial gift from our church staff to let you know how much we believe in what you are doing and to remind us that we are a family serving this city together. And if your treasure is where your heart is, then we want our heart to be for your success. We are praying and believing with you, Pastor Jason Isaacs, Hope City. And it was, it was signed by five or six, their, their entire staff. I actually asked our finance people when I got that letter, I said, hey, uh, I'm just curious how, how much they had given and they wouldn't tell me and they've never told me anytime I've ever asked. They said, those are private, That's, you, you don't need to know that. And I kept trying different angles, but they, they wouldn't tell me. Uh, but on that morning when they brought that letter over, Jason felt like the Lord prompted him to do that and he shared the idea with his staff and they agreed and they willingly participated and they gave. And that type of a spirit is so refreshing. And I think God blesses that type of sacrifice when people choose to build his kingdom by emptying their jar. And they didn't have to do that. They, like Joseph, wanted to be obedient to God's promptings though. And through their generosity, they, they helped the Southwest campus become a reality. Well, here's our second observation that we, we see from Joseph's life, and that is that, that sacrifice will always cost you something. It will always cost you something. Look in Matthew chapter two, verses 19 through 21. When Herod died, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt. Get up, the angel said, take the child and his mother back to the land of Israel because those who were trying to kill the child are dead. So Joseph got up and returned to the land of Israel with Jesus and his mother. So Joseph, you're going back to Israel now. You're gonna cover that same long journey, only now you have a squirming toddler with you. But you can go because Herod is dead. And so they loaded up the donkey, they said goodbye to new friends that they had just made, 
and they started on their journey back from Egypt. And that journey would have been over 220 miles on the low side, 350 miles on the high side. In other words, 30 days to 45 days of travel. How do you finance two moves and that much travel when you barely have time to start a business and, and even begin to attract any new customers? Well, as, as we talked about last week in, in the message, Mary and Joseph probably had to sell off some of the gold, frankincense, and myrrh that had been given to them from the wise men. Make certain that you, you catch this. God will never ask you to do something without also providing the means or the methods to accomplish it. He will always come through if he asks you to do something. I have seen him do it in my own life time and time again, times when we had nothing or times when we had sacrificed for, for some ministry or for, for a church project here at Southeast. He has always been faithful. He doesn't promise that we're going to get our wants, but he does promise that we will get our needs. He will always provide. And he's done that for nearly 60 years with this church and in this church. And in so many different seasons, he's shown up when, when we sacrificed. Let me tell you about a pivotal time in this church's history. Southeast was kind of bursting at the seams in the mid-1980s, and, and so they were in a, in a sanctuary that held about 500 people. And so they bought property down the street on the same street on Hikes Lane. They bought 10 acres of land. When they were in the middle of the construction, the church was running about 1,500 people, and the building that they were building was going to seat 2,000 people. And the campaign to pay for all of that was built around the idea that this is kind of a once in a lifetime uh, offering and commitment over the course of the next few years. And, and this church home is going to last us for decades. But because so many people emptied their jar, I think God blessed in just extraordinary ways. And so Southeast moved into this new building on Hikes Lane in 1987. And just four years later, in 1991, Bob Russell stood in front of the congregation and he said, the elders have voted unanimously to begin exploring, moving again and looking for property and building a bigger building so that we can reach more people. Now this was just on the heels of where a year or two before these people had just finished fulfilling their financial pledges and commitments. But the elders were, were so convinced that that was God's will that they even went on to say, even if we can't sell our current building, we still are gonna move. In other words, we're, we're gonna burn our bridges Sacrifice will always cost you something, but if God's in it, there will be an eternal return on your investment. And many of us at Southeast, today we find ourselves sitting under the shade of a tree that somebody else planted. In Joseph's case, his sacrifices cost him more than money. It went beyond that. Back when Joseph discovers that Mary is pregnant and he knows that he's not the father, she explains it. Well, the spirit of the Lord is responsible and this baby will be God's son. Matthew chapter one, verse 19 says, Joseph says, Joseph to whom she was engaged was a righteous man and did not want to disgrace her publicly. So he decided to break the engagement quietly. That phrase was a righteous man. In, in, in some translations, it says being a just man. And that loses a little something for us in, in our English translation. But to a Jewish reader, the phrase being a just man, what it said was that, that Joseph was a serious student of God's word and that he was rising in the ranks. He was what was called a Sadiq. A, a Sadiq was a, a scholar who studied the Torah, who, who studied diligently the, the Old Testament law. He could quote lengthy passages and, and scriptures. And for a common carpenter to have this accomplishment of being a Sadiq would have just been incredible. But with Mary's pregnancy, now his religious standing would be in question. And he has to choose either the law or love. And then an angel of the Lord appears to Joseph in a dream 
and says, take her as your wife. This is God's son. I want you to imagine the scene of of Joseph being brought to the city leaders. No one would believe the truth. So what, what is he supposed to say? How is he supposed to explain Mary's condition? Would he trash her character or his own social and religious standing? Max Lucado put it well. Joseph tanked his reputation. He swapped his Sadiq diploma for a pregnant fiance and an illegitimate son. And he made the big decision of discipleship. He placed God's plan ahead of his own. That last phrase right there is a definition of what sacrifice is. He placed God's plan ahead of his own. That's what he did because that's just the way Joseph operated. He emptied his reputation jar because he trusted that God's ways were better than his. What sacrifices are are you willing to make in order to be obedient to God's plan? I mean, would you be willing to forego your own advancement, whatever that might look like, to show your faith and your trust in God's plan? Are you willing to risk your status at work by inviting some coworkers that would be the last person anyone would ever think would come to a Christmas Eve worship service with you? At your college, would you be willing to exchange popularity for purity? What or who would you empty your jar for? Toward the end of my granddad's life, he had a season where he became quite selfish when it came to money and possessions. And he was in a pattern of making some very unwise choices. My grandmother had passed away a couple of years before and my grandfather decided that he would take all the farm equipment, all the family furniture, all my grandmother's belongings, even her wedding ring and sell them at a public auction to provide cash for some some luxuries he wanted. He just wanted to kind of live a lavish lifestyle for a while. And wise friends tried to talk some sense into him, but nothing would dissuade him. And as you can imagine, the day of the auction was very emotional for the entire town, seeing all these personal items displayed. I later learned that my my grandfather's five children were given no chance to purchase items beforehand. And when they asked, even those of sentimental value, My granddad said, you'll have a chance to bid on them like everybody else. I vividly remember watching my uncle, Phil, who was in his 40s, bid on a red rusty wagon that had painted on the side, Philip. It was a sad day. And one of the family keepsakes that my mom was quite interested in was a beautiful wedding ring designed handmade quilt. It was my grandmother's favorite quilt and so my mom really wanted to keep it in the family. However, a very determined antique dealer wanted to purchase it so that he could then resell it. And through the course of time, the bidding reached a point beyond my mom's self-imposed spending limit. And, And when it did, it was more than she could bear. And so she just withdrew from the bidding. And overcome by emotion and wounded by her father's insensitivity, she just walked out of the auction area. And the auctioneer continued and the bids went higher. But then a strange scene began to unfold. As my older brother, Jeff, who was in his mid-20s and had absolutely no money to his name, began bidding on the quilt. The bidding went higher and higher. And several minutes later, the auctioneer said, sold. They folded up Jeff's purchase and he carried it out of the auction barn and he found mom and handed her the quilt. He said, I love you. And they hugged while we cried. And years later, my brother would say, I spent more than I really had. I paid more than I probably should have, but I have never regretted buying that quilt. Sometimes sacrifice is difficult to define, but you know it when you see it. And sacrifice is giving up something that you love for something that you love more. So what will you empty your jar for? What will it take? Who will it take? 
Would you do it for some women who have been trafficked and need a safe place to stay? Would you do it for a Bullock County person who needs a campus to learn about Christ? Would you do it for Mayfield, Kentucky so that they can sense and feel the love of Jesus Christ? Joseph sacrificed his reputation in order to do God's will. Let's make one more observation. And that is the sacrifice will entail ongoing submission. It will entail ongoing submission. In other words, this is continual action. Matthew chapter two, verses 22 and 23. But when he learned that the new ruler of Judea was Herod's son, Archelaus, he was afraid to go there. This is talking about Joseph. Then after being warned in a dream, he left for the region of Galilee. So the family went and lived in a town called Nazareth. This fulfilled what the prophets had said. He will be called a Nazarene. Another messianic reference to more details of the Messiah. This is the fourth time in the first two chapters of Matthew where God has sent an angel in a dream to convey something to Joseph. And every single time, Joseph has obeyed. And when you choose to empty the jar, it becomes more of a way of life. It's, it's, it's a journey rather than a one-time event that you check off. It's an ongoing emptying. It's saying, here I am, Lord. I wanna keep being used by you. Late in October, a close friend of mine, Southeast member Bob Lijan, died unexpectedly of a heart attack. He was one of the most generous people that I've ever known. He never made a big, big deal out of his generosity. He just loved to do it, that's just who he was. One time he and his wife Linda went with us to a ministry retreat down in Florida. Bob and I were playing golf and we got talking to the cart girl and after a couple minutes, somehow it just went beneath the surface and we got in this deep conversation. And I can remember the three of us praying for her there And before I had even said amen, Bob had reached in his wallet, pulled out every every dollar he had and gave it to her. That's just what he did time and time again. That's who he was. He would always give us a hard time whenever we would preach on giving. Didn't matter if it was Bob Russell, myself, it didn't matter if it was Kyle Eidelman. If if we preached on giving, he he would say, oh, we got another shakedown sermon today. I said, what's a shakedown, sir? You're going to shake us down for every penny we've got. (laughs) He'd say, I don't have any money to even buy lunch after your shakedown sermons. (laughs) But I'll tell you what, after every shakedown, he was the first to step up. Another time, Beth and I were trying to help a gal get back on her feet. We helped her get a job. Some other things, the missing ingredient was she needed a car. And so I called Bob and Bob stepped in and helped us get a car. And it really didn't matter that he didn't know her. It didn't matter that he had never met her. He just wanted to help out. Bob and Linda lived in the same house for 30 years. You say, why in the world would somebody live in the same house for 30 years? I think I know why. I think it was so that they could give more. <laughs> At the end of his funeral, I asked this question of the 250 people who were there. I said, if Bob ever went the extra mile by giving an unexpected gift to you or being extremely generous to you in some way, would you raise your hand? And I'm telling you, 80% of that room, they shot their hands up so quickly. They, They just couldn't wait to tell of the generosity of Bob. What a testimony. You see, Bob kept emptying the jar and God kept filling it back up and Bob kept emptying the jar and God kept filling it back up. It's a pretty fun game to play, but it will involve a lot of trust and ongoing submission to God's plan. And I could name so many of you at so many different campuses here at this church And the common thread, you're exactly that same way. And you have this joy in your life because you hold on to the things of this world loosely. You see yourself more as a conduit rather than as a stockpiler. I like what Matthew chapter six, 
verses three and four says, Jesus is talking, says, but when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing so that your giving may be in secret. Then your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. That's what's going to happen. For God so loved the world that he gave. We never look more like God than when we give. Several months ago, I had a buddy of mine who who doesn't go to church here, but this Christian man texted me and he said that that he had some money that he would like for me to give away to a ministry. It was a substantial amount and I'd never gotten a text like this. And he said, you can choose any ministry that, that you want. And I'm telling you what, I felt like a kid in a candy store. And I had so much fun just praying and pondering where God could use this money the best. And a few days later, I was on an airplane and I was actually on this airplane flying into Louisville and I'm making a list of different possibilities in my mind and I'm praying about where, where God, where do you wanna send this money? We land, I get my stuff out of the overhead bin and a guy three rows behind says, hey Dave, I, I just want you to know we appreciate everything you, you do and everything that, that Southeast does in, in the community. I said, well, thanks, thanks a lot. Got off the plane, I waited for him to come off. I met him, we walked toward baggage claim. He said he was a pastor in town. Through the course of conversation, I discovered that his name was Jason. And he was the guy whose letter I read to you earlier. He was the pastor who gave along with his staff that sacrificial gift when the Southwest campus was about to open. And I told him how much that gift meant to our church. I said, what a display of obedience to what God put on your heart. And then I said, I I don't recall, how how much was that gift? (laughs) Got him. (laughs) And he said, it it was was $1,000. I said, for your staff to give $1,000. I said, it's like a million bucks to our church. But there was a reason I asked seven years ago and there was a reason that I asked last month. Because in that instant, I knew where I was gonna give my friends financial gift. And a couple of weeks after that, I met Jason for lunch and toward the end of the meal, I gave him a letter that I'd written. It said, the gift you and your church gave us seven years ago was a huge encouragement. I've always wanted your act of generosity to be multiplied. And now because of a, a friend's obedience to God's prompting and because of, of this friend's sacrifice and generosity, uh, Hope City can be blessed. And I wrote out this verse from Mark 10, 28 through 30. Then Peter spoke up, we have left everything to follow you. Truly I tell you, Jesus replied, no one who has left home or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for me and the gospel will fail to receive a hundred times as much in this present age. And I handed him the check across the table and we're sitting in McAllister's and he, he just starts weeping. And when he was about to collect himself, he he finally was able to talk and he said, we've been looking for a bigger place for us to worship so we can reach more people. But it seems that every door has been shut and I've become quite discouraged in recent weeks and I wondered if we should just stop our search and now you give me this check. And I think God is just saying, I'm here, I've got this for you. Our God is so creative with his unorthodox and unusual methods to get his money to different people and causes at just the right time. We just need to be obedient to his leading. And that day I found out that there is nothing more fun than giving away somebody else's money. (laughs) There is one thing more fun. And there is one thing more fulfilling. And that's giving away your own money. There's a joy in sacrifice when you provide Christmas gifts for someone who can't afford it. When you sacrifice some of your days off work at Christmas to help clean debris in Western Kentucky. When you give blood to the Red Cross. When you take the time to invest in a child who doesn't have a father or a mother. When you participate in the empty the jar campaign. It's as simple as just Texting the word give to 733-733 and saying, okay, Lord, I I, I wanna empty this jar. 
What I'm saying is maybe it's time for you to plant a shade tree for someone else to empty your jar and and to pour it out. And can I say something? As Americans, we all have another jar anyway. You can give without loving, but you cannot love without giving. Crawford Laritz said it well. He said, at birth, you look like your parents. At death, you look like your decisions. So here's my question for you. At your funeral, how many people will raise their hands and say that you were generous and you were sacrificial? Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, will you help us to make the decision to empty the jar, to give you our time, our talent, our treasure, our testimony, be willing to empty our reputation, our social status, just so that your name can be advanced. Lord, would you help us to let go so that you can do your work through us? It's in the powerful name of Jesus that we pray. And all God's people said. Well, some of you you need to put God's plan over your own. And I have a feeling if that's you, maybe God's put something on your heart. Uh, Even today, you know what that is. And so we want to give you an opportunity to respond to that challenge and I love what uh, Dave said there at the end, that quote of decision. I know there's some of you in here that need to make the best decision that you'll ever make in your life by surrendering your life to Jesus. And again, we wanna give you an opportunity to do that. Our next step room is over here on your left, and we have some folks who'd love to walk with you on that journey. I'd love to pray with you or anything that you need, they want to walk with you on that. So we're going to sing a song here in these next few moments that that speaks of Christ being magnified in our lives. And we can't magnify him without surrender to him first. And so you can come in the next song, or even when our service is over, you can still visit there. Uh, People will be glad to connect with you. But let's stand and sing together.
your presence, your love, your mercy, your grace. We definitely did not deserve you to come here and rescue us. Help me sing. Singing of Christ be magnified. Let Church, let them hear you. Sing it up, sing it up. Christ be magnified. He's worthy of our praise. Let his praise Christ be magnified in me. Solomon, sing it up. Christ be magnified. From the altar of my life. The altar of my life. Christ be magnified. Such a um, such powerful service, family. I just love hear, hearing everybody's voices sing. And so I hope this has been powerful for you. I know I love what Amy said um, on Facebook, just said, we sit in the shade of a tree that someone else planted. And it's so humbling to think about the sacrifices that allow us to be where we are today. And it's just been so true. This has been such a good series for us as we've just leaned in and just said, hey, Lord, we just, want, we just want to have open hands, and that's been a gift. And so I hope that you know this. Um, we also want to have open hands with you. And if there's some of you out there that you just hear like, man, I could really use some friends come alongside me. I really could use the church come alongside. I hope that you know. All you have to do is text the word, connect to 733-733. We would love family, love to help you out, uh, love to step into your life any way that we can. Um, I love this. Nikki from YouTube said this, said uh, that you are joining from a hotel room in Calvert City in my day, on my day off from the Red Cross response, grateful for the online streaming so I can be here. And uh, so many of you, I was down uh, kind of in the areas affected by the tornado just this week and just seeing all that. And I just want to say again, um, that's why we're trying to empty the jar here. We just want to be a responsive to people. And um, so I hope that you know you can give. Uh, again, all you have to do is text the word GIVE to 733-733 to lean into the Give the Jar, uh, Empty the Jar campaign as well as just click on this little button here and uh, we'll make sure and get you connected to that. Uh, but it's an honor, it really is, to just, um, kind of like Dave said, to give away other people's money. And even as he said that, I thought to myself, I thought, you know, for me, I know a lot of you are the same way. It's to the point where when you, I'm giving away my money, I realize it's not really my money anyways. And um, that's just been a real gift. So a couple things uh, coming up for you, just want you to know is number one, um, uh, Kyle's new book is coming out. It's called uh, One at a Time. It's kind of the heartbeat of our church right now if you haven't picked that up. 
And um, so we're doing pre-order stuff. A lot of us have already read it, and man, would love for, uh, to make that available. We're going to be going through an empty the jar campaign uh, series in January. I want you to be a part of that. But then, second of all, um, just want to make sure that you're tagged into groups. Um, looking forward to, to getting you signed up and getting you engaged. But but uh, listen, family, it's Christmas week. Hope that uh, I know sometimes uh, for hol- for some of you the holidays can be a little tough. For some of you, it's an absolute blast. We just want to say this from our heart to yours, SE Online family. We just want to say, either way, we love you. We're with you. Uh, let's fix our eyes on Jesus. Let's fix our eyes on the God who said, I love you so much that I just want to give you my son. And that's what we're celebrating this week. And so love you. Hope to see you uh, on Thursday or Friday night uh, for the Christmas Eve series. But other than that, family, happy, merry, amazing Christmas. God bless. Love you.